the Ford assembly plant in St. Paul, Minnesota, and our local union heard about a, uh, a dispute that had taken place in Mexico where uh, thugs had attacked workers in a Ford assembly plant in Cuautitlan, Mexico, and several workers were wounded and one died. Next. Our local union along with others in the US and other parts of the world did support work for the dissident group involved in this, the Ford Workers Democratic Movement. Next. In 1996, I was attending a meeting of the Coalition for Justice in the Maquiladoras in Texas, and a staff person for the newly elected president of the AFL-CIO approached me and told me that they believed that the American Institute for Free Labor Development had been involved in this, and that he agreed that this was they were linked to the CIA. I, at that time, I wasn't able to learn anything more about what happened, but when I retired in 2016, I just started, decided to start looking into this and research it. And now it's been almost six years I've been working on this, and I do believe I know what happened. Uh, next slide. During the 1980s, uh, Mexico was in a severe economic depression based on the collapse of the world economy and their dependence on oil. Um, inflation reached triple digits, social spending was cut back. Um, the ruling political party, the Institutional Revolutionary Party began instituting a lot of free market, hyper-competitive capitalist uh, reforms to try to revive their economy. And in 1985, a major earthquake hit Mexico City and then that would result in a political crisis in Mexico. So we can go to the next slide. Um, in 1998, Quadahomic Cardenas challenged, he broke from the PRI and challenged that candidate. Um, and there also their 65 year history of ruling Mexico. In his coalition, uh, with a lot of the groups who were involved in the earthquake support work, and they had socialists and communists in his coalition. In that election, which today is widely considered to have been fraudulent, the opposition parties would not accept the government ruling that Carlos Salinas had won. The military seized the ballot boxes and a few years later, those were burnt. Uh, and this really set off alarm in the US who had considered Mexico a very safe, stable place. Um, next slide. This is uh, John Negroponte, who is quite a well-known person. He had been ambassador in Honduras prior to this and it helped support the Contras, even though that had been prohibited by Congress. And he did this behind the scenes and Iran-Contra and a lot of aid to the Honduras government. But when things went south in Mexico in 88, he was sent to Mexico to be the ambassador. Uh, next slide. This is Robert Passerino, who was the deputy chief of mission at the embassy. And among his other national security accomplishments, he wrote the first conceptual draft of NAFTA while he was there. Uh, next slide. While all this was going on in Mexico, US auto companies started to move south um, and build production facilities in Northern Mexico, which were geared strictly for export to the US. Um, the Ford Cuautitlan plant, which was located just outside of Mexico City was for the domestic market. And they were really suffering along with the economy. Ford built two new plants in Northern Mexico designed for export. And Ford had to align the contract of this older plant in Mexico City with the new lower wage and benefit contracts in northern Mexico. Um, all of the Ford unions, all the Ford plants were represented by the Confederation of Mexican Workers, which is a part of the PRI and the ruling party, and it had been for 65 years too quite a reputation for corruption and subservience. So this week they were thrown out of a GM plant in Saleo 
Mexico by a 78% vote of the workers, a free election was finally allowed and the CTM was gone. But, um, so in 1987, Ford began negotiating for their new contract. Not quite ready for that one yet. All right, yeah, this, is, this takes a while to explain what the contract happened. In 87, Ford started contract negotiations at Quatitlan. Sales were terrible, they needed a layoff didn't want to do that. What they did was Ford refused to meet the government's 27% wage increase that they recommended that year. The CTM called a strike, but Ford paid half the wages of the workers while they were on strike. The problem for the workers was that after three months, uh, an employer could terminate their labor agreement, which they did. And when the new labor agreement, they fired everybody, 3,500 people, 600 permanently were never called back. And when it was all said and done and the new labor agreement finally ratified, it amounted to a 40% wage increase, 40% wage cut, a decrease of 40% for these Mexican workers. Okay, now we can go to the next symbol, the next slide. Yeah, there was opposition in the plant to the CTM throughout this whole period. And starting in the early 80s, they really gained a lot of strength in the local union and they were one of several groups organizing, but by the late eighties, they were, them and their supporters were in almost complete control of the local union. And they also, in doing this, gained quite a reputation throughout Mexico for building a democratic and militant union. They were getting a lot of attention and publicity and they were headed for problems. Um, next, next slide. The, head, the, the CTM, there are three Ford plants in Mexico. There was a Ford CTM. The head of that union had been appointed but had to run for election in 1989, in July of 89. The Cuauhtitlan dissidents were planning on challenging him. And because of the size of the Quetitlan local, they were very sure that they would win that election, which is really a significant post. Um, three weeks before the election, all the candidates, all the potential candidates, the executive committee of the local union was fired by Ford. And then the struggle began there in earnest and they founded the Ford Workers Democratic Movement. These fired workers continued to act as the local leaderships and they still had support from the workers in the plant. Later, they, they carried on a lot of struggle. They did a hunger strike. They did a lot of things to keep the struggle light, alive. But later in the year, there became a major pay problem. In the spring with the election with Urarte, Ford had made profit sharing payments, which they did do in all their plants. They didn't withhold taxes to increase the amount of that profit sharing to help your art day and make people think things were going well. When December came, they withheld the taxes and the paychecks became very small, in some cases, non-existent. The workers believed your art day. No one had communicated this to them and they believed your art day had embezzled the money. They walked out and shut down the plant. They returned early in January. And at that time, some of the leaders were leafleting the plant, calling on workers to come to a meeting with the CTM. They were kidnapped by 30 gun wielding thugs. When the workers in the plant learned about this, they went in a sit down strike and shut the plant down. The kidnapped leaders were released that Friday and everyone came back to work Monday morning. There were 300 thugs in the plant. You can go to the next slide now. There were 300 thugs in the plant, uh, intimidating the workers and obviously had come there with a purpose. The workers had gotten wind that they were coming organized and drove the thugs out. And that's when the gunfire and violence erupted with nine workers being shot. As a result of that, the workers decided to occupy the plant, which they did. They occupied the plant for two weeks, issued demands, that's a good one, yeah. They issued demands and among these was they wanted all the executive committee rehired and they wanted um, a national democratic Congress on union rights in Mexico. And they held the Ford plant for two weeks on these demands. 
And after two weeks, 2000 police drove them out. They eventually were able to get production going again by threatening to fire everyone. Uh, the Mexican government let them terminate the labor agreement, let Ford terminate the labor agreement. They fired everyone and slowly, slowly got people back to work. They finally ended up having to negotiate with the local union, but it did result in 600, again, 600 permanent um, dismissals. Um, why don't we go on the next one and then go on to the next one. Who the group of 300 thugs was, was always vague. Ford denied having anything to do with it. The CTM held a press conference and called for an investigation of a gangster named Wallace de la Mancha, who was widely reported to be leading the group that attacked the workers. Um, Mancha died mysteriously a few months after this failed attack. And um, I really believe that Mancha was a CIA contract agent. Uh, I've got some documents that will show how I came to that conclusion. Or I'll show here at the end of the slide. So wait, why don't we move on there? So I, one of the things I did was investigate the history of the American Institute for Free Labor Development. And one thing I did was investigate the guy who'd been its director for 30 years. And this is the guy in the middle here, Bill Doherty. Um, there is no question in my mind that he was a career CIA agent. And looking at his biography, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And a number of former CIA agents also said that he was CIA. So he was running this group, the American Institute for Free Labor Development. Um, I just would, about AFELD, it was a government created organization managed by the CIA for which the AFL CIO provided cover throughout. And still, exactly what their relationship was to AFELD, you cannot get anybody in the AFL CIO to say. So I want to go to the next slide here. I look, there was quite a debate in labor about AFELD, especially in the 60s, largely in the part of the Ruthers. In 1966, Victor Ruther did an interview with the Los Angeles Times in which he said uh, he linked AFELD, the CIA, and AFL-CIO foreign policy. Um, the, the, that resulted in a very contentious AFL-CIO meeting. Joe Bierne here, made a resolution to condemn Victor, which passed by a vote of 23 to two. The UAW left the AFL-CIO at that point and Walter started a rival labor federation. So we can go on to the next one. Yeah, so looking at how did this debate end, we come to the Walter Ruther's death, which I thought I knew a lot about UAW history. I did not know there was a mystery to Walter Ruther's death but there is quite an unresolved mystery and the documents <laughs> do not point to an accident. Uh, so there we have how that debate ended in the 60s over AFELD. Why don't we go on to the next slide. Another figure that the Ruthers had a lot of conflict with was Jay Lovestone. And that went back to internal UAW politics in the 1930s, it started. Uh, when he came into the UAW to push out the communists and the Ruthers in that battle sided with the communists. Um, in that 1966 article, Victor Ruther called AFL-CIO foreign policy a vest pocket operation of Jay Lovestone. So there's Lovestone's bio, bio there. He had a close personal relationship with James Angleton, who was a chief counterintelligence of the CIA. When he was in Washington, he stayed with Angleton. And in 1974, Colby finally did an investigation about Lovestone and they admitted he was being paid by the CIA. Angleton was able to keep that quiet for many years. Okay, I go on to the next one. Yeah, so this is, um, Again, during the Cold War, AFL foreign policy was really run 
directly by CIA agents. So we had two international affairs directors and all of these institutes, the American Institute for Free Labor Development, the African American Labor Center, the Asian American Free Labor Institute were all managed by CIA agents. Uh, and that, I think what we look at in the book is what did the, what happened here at Quetitlan, how did that negatively affect labor and what was the role of the CIA in this? So I've gone to these documents here now, I, in case people are interested in some of the proof uh, I have of this. So why don't we move on to the first one? I'm gonna read, can you, I don't know if people can read these or not, were they too small? Why don't we go back to the first one? I'll describe what it is. The first document is from the Ruther Library at Wayne State. Both the UAW and the AFL CIO's International Affairs Department archive files for these years are closed. This memo is concerns a charter jet flight from Washington, D.C. to San Diego. It was found in the Bieber node there. It was issued less than three weeks after the fraudulent Mexican presidential election of 1988 and was narrowly certified by the Mexican Congress that same month. Uh, one of the passengers on this flight is Hector Uriarte, who had been appointed as the general secretary. If you see his name there, he's in the group of three to four Mexicans. Um, also on this flight, you see um, Steve Beckman, Mark Anderson were both International Affairs Department staff people at the time, and they both gave me phone interviews about what was going on here. They had no meeting with these Mexicans in Washington at this time. They also don't believe that either Donahue, who was the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO, or Owen Bieber, who was president of the UAW, could have met with these Mexicans without them there. So that leaves uh, Bill Doherty there, um, William Doherty, number four, meeting with these Mexicans in Washington three weeks after the election, and this months before this purge began of the dissidents at Guatitlan. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one. I did a Freedom of Information Act request with uh, the Department of State, which was quite a battle. I, don't, I got a lot of help or I wouldn't have got that. The first one, why don't you back up one? The first one, I read about that one. Uh, this is an embassy cable summarizing Ford's view of the dispute at the plant. And that looks like it's really hard to read. But what they say is when they talk to the embassy two days after the attack, was they believed the attackers were members of the Revolutionary Workers' Party, which was, it just shows they were totally confused about what happened. The, the, the supporters and members of the Revolutionary Party were the objects of the attack. And the papers were already saying who was involved, and it was Wallace de la Mancha. So I, it really shows that Ford was not an architect of this attack. Um, why don't we move on to the next one? This is another embassy cable. Now, th this one was written in response to a letter someone from my local union wrote the Mexican embassy there, Negro Ponte, the ambassador. So if you read that, this got the ambassador Negro Ponte very concerned about our local union support. So if you read the first couple sentences, that's UAW local 879 in St. Paul. That was the local I was a member of. He goes on to explain what's going on there. He mentions a name of somebody from Afeld who was involved. And this is a, a cable to the Secretary of State. So um, this closely links Afeld to the events that took place there. And he also, and this one says, he should notify Bill Doherty of our local union support for these workers in Mexico, which again raises the specter of CIA suppression and dissent over labor. So that's, that's the slides I have. And before we get into questions, I would like to give my collaborator, Patrick Dunn, a little chance to introduce himself here and say a few words, if that's okay. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, hi, I'll just be very quick. Um, thank you everyone for having me and having us both tonight. I met Rob back at the George Meany Memorial Archives back in the summer of 2018, when I was working on my undergraduate dissertation on the AFL-CIO's um, intervention in Chile during the Allende Premiership in 1973. Um, Rob was working on the story of El Golpe back then. Um, I think that's a testament to the fact that he has dedicated some of the best years of his life, you could say, to this project and this research. And um, 
I, it's been a real privilege to work with him. I'm generally incredibly grateful. And I think everyone else here should be too. Um, we finally got it published. It's happening. If um, if the story that he's just outlined is not enough to convince you that it's worth a copy, especially with the 40% discount I see ICC members are getting, um, I would say that the first part of the book hopefully makes it worth it as well. It's a kind of a mini anthology almost on the with, with some different case studies on where else American labor aristocracy interfered in other countries, Brazil, British Guyana, Chile, the chapter I wrote, um, as well as just giving the context and detailing exactly how infiltrated these organizations were by the CIA, they also kind of get a proper deep dive into the sort of tactics used to undermine left-wing movements and left-wing governments in the global south. They look at how effective they were as well, and I think in certainly the case of Chile, there's a very strong argument to be had that, um, you know, without AFIL's activities, that government might not have fallen and the, you know, the history of that country might have been different. Um, so if that's not enough, I would encourage that uh, to be another motivating factor to buy it. But just once again, I want to say well done, Rob, for getting us this far. And once again, Manny and Stuart, thank you for having us tonight. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure uh, having you both uh, here. And, um, and maybe we should start out with Kim giving some commentary on this, uh, this book. I think you've read it, right, Kim? Uh, you're muted. Kim, you're muted. There yeah, you go. I, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I've read, I have read the book. I have reviewed it. In fact, I've already got a copy of the review at uh, Covert Action Magazine. So trying to give the guys a, a leg up. They, they did a stunning, stunning job. Um, and I highly, highly recommend the book for everybody. Uh, they've, they've really brought in some from really strong evidence about what's going, what went on in Mexico. They, they had some preceding things that Patrick just laid out. Uh, it's very, very, very powerful. Um, and I think, I think they make a quite strong case. Uh, it, it gives us now the, fir the most detailed example of a field or any of the uh, AFL foreign uh, operations, their day-to-day their, their -day effect on workers in the plants and stuff like that. Um, previous to that, I had had the best account uh, from the Philippines for, I found them working with the death squad in the Philippines, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, but this is much more laid out, and they've done a great job. They, they interviewed, they found a, there was a Mexican a graduate student that was going to Mexico and she carried out some interviews for them with, with some of the workers that had been on the, in the plant, things like that. So they really did an excellent job. It's really worth looking at. Uh, Manny, can, do you want me to go ahead and sort of put this in a larger context? Uh, as far as labor's foreign policy, would you like me to do that, or you want to go on? Yeah, yeah, I think it would be great, and also maybe kind of allude to perhaps some kind of questions that we can, uh, you know, that you may want to address to uh, Rob and Patrick. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Now I'm going to make some comments. Uh, by far, I mean, I, I, I think by there's no question they have the best example of stuff on Mexico. I differ with some of their analyses. But uh, so you can't attribute what I say to them unless they claim it. Um, and, and that's fine. We'll, you know, probably be at long after we, all of us die that we get the, get the final answers. But I'm, so I'm going to raise some questions. I think the thing that we need to recognize is that for people who know of the AFL-CIO foreign policy, they believe that it emerged in the late 1940s to fight the communists and particularly the Soviet Union. That is not true. The, uh, AF, the AFL under Samuel Gompers began working in uh, carrying out their foreign policy in the late 1800s. It goes back long before the Soviet Union. Um, and it, it continues. And in, I did a book in 2010 called uh, the AFL-CIO's Secret War Against Developing Country Workers. That's what it looks like. Um, and I, in my whole first chapter talks about how it emerged and, and things such as this. Um, during the, during the uh, uh, late 40s, they did get involved. They, they were working with the CIA, particularly in France and Italy. 
uh, then they had they were working in Latin America in the late 40s, but that sort of attenuated by about 1958, and they broke the ties with the CIA. One of the differences between uh, the, that I have with Rob, and we've talked about this, so I'm not this is nothing new for him, is that um, I argue that this foreign policy in labor came from the late from inside the labor movement. It was not a product of external forces such as the uh, CIA or the White House or the State Department or things like this. I think these operations came from within labor. Um, now, there's no question they've worked with the CIA. In fact, uh, Rob sent me a reference and said somebody had who was on the inside said that there had been a CIA agent at every one of their uh, offices throughout Latin America, and I, I totally accept that. But I really do think from everything I've seen, and I've been studying this now for almost 40 years, my conclusion is it comes out of the labor movement. Okay, anyway, so you get this stuff uh, during the late 80s. We, uh, there was a growing amount of resistance to this. Uh, more and more got exposed. The key person was a guy named Fred Hirsch. Fred was a, was a plumber who exposed the uh, Afield's role in Chile, which, Chile, uh, which uh, Patrick was talking about. Fred revealed uh, Afield's involvement within a year, got a formal resolution passed through the San Jose uh, Central Labor Council, and uh, Doherty flew out to change this. Doherty freaked out. Um, and, uh, but Fred and his folks were able to hold the line, and, and they wouldn't rescind that that resolution. It was a major thing. Fred's a major, major player in this. And uh, I think that has, has to be recognized. Um, and then throughout the 80s, people are resisting this into, uh, into the, the mid 90s. Now, one of the things, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, details. And by the way, with the announcement of the meeting, uh, Manny in, in included a paper that I did on the AFL-CIO's foreign policy, and there's a lot of references and stuff like this. So if you want details, uh, I think this is, uh, this is an excellent article, if I say so myself, to, to go in there. Anyway, um, in, in the early 90s, we uh, activists had raised so much hell about this that uh, John Sweeney, when he ran for president in the first contested election of the AFL-CIO, um, decided he would run against Afield and uh, against this foreign policy, even though Sweeney himself was on the boards of Afield and the African American Labor Center and AFLI, the Asian American Free Labor Institute. Um, Sweeney won, he kept his word as far as closing those, re those regional organizations down, but he started something he called the Solidarity Center. And originally it was called the uh, Center for International Labor Solidarity, or ACLS. It's now, it's now been changed to, uh, it's now been changed to the Solidarity Center. That was its nickname all the time. Now it's been formally changed. Anyway, they are working with the National Endowment for Democracy, NED. Now, NED, as far as I'm concerned, has, uh, makes the CIA, as horrible as they are, makes their ethics look impeccable. The NED is, pure, is just terrible. Uh, they lie from the beginning. They tell you right offhand that they're a private, independent organization, and that is a lie. They were created by the US Congress. They were signed into power to that great freedom-loving Democrat, uh, Ronald Reagan in 1983. Um, they have always gotten about 90% of their funding from the US government. They get an annual subsidy from Congress. Uh, this is no more, I mean, if they're independent, I can fly and believe me, my feet don't leave the ground uh, without help. So it's, it's, utter, it's utter lying nonsense. Now, the NED has four what they call institutes. So you have the national the international wing of the Democratic Party. You have the international wing of the Republican Party. You have the international wing of the US Chamber of Commerce. And you have the Solidarity Center, the international wing of the AFL-CIO. Those four institutes are key to running the NED. Anything NED does, the AFL-CIO is involved. And to show you 
I'm not talking about uh, minor players. I uh, was looking, I hate to do research because it just uh, on them because it sets me off because they're lying so much. <laughs> but I went back last night and I see that AFL CIO president Liz Schuler has just stepped down from the NED board uh, and has now become the chair of the board of the trustees of the Solidarity Center. You know, we're talking the very top level. Now, what you also have to understand is this has always been done behind the backs of uh, AFL-CIO members. And in fact, most of our leaders, most of our leaders don't even know this shit. Um, but it's, it's gone on. In 2005, uh, Fred Hirsch and I were working together. I had lived in California, moved to the Midwest to go to graduate school. Fred stayed out in the Bay Area. And in 2004, uh, uh, he and some other people in California got the uh, California State AFL-CIO. Um, they, they have a biannual conference. And at their 2004 biannual conference, they had 400 delegates representing 2.6 million workers. This was one sixth of the entire AFL-CIO. 400 delegates unanimously condemned the AFL-CIO foreign policy, okay? And then uh, uh, California sent their resolution to the national AFL-CIO for the 2005 uh, uh, convention, which took place in Chicago. Now that's where I was living at the time and myself and others in this area organized a series of demonstrations and, and protests at that time. Uh, uh, Fred got his labor council to send out 5,000 packets of information across the country to, to labor unions. Uh, we mobilized. I did a lot. I had a lot of writing go on, other people writing. I see Judy Ansells here. She had contributed. Uh, Peter Ratchliff had contributed. Fred and, as, and myself. We were People were just cramming out work, and we were just all over the place and raised holy hell. Well, it went to, like I say, the resolution went to uh, the, the national AFL-CIO, and John Sweeney had appointed Gerald McEntee, the head of AFSCME, to be head of the resolutions committee, and McEntee changed the resolution from one condemning the AFL-CIO's foreign policy to one praising it, and they took that to the resolution, they took that to the convention, would not let our people speak, they wouldn't even let us speak, much less, have, you know, anything else like that, and it passed, so it passed that it was condemned. So when they did that, we had been, you know, part of the issue that we had had was if we exposed what the labor movement was doing, of course, its, its enemies could, be, could use it against them. So we had been sort of keeping this in-house in the labor movement. When they pulled that crap in Chicago, I said, gloves off. And I ended up writing this book, like I say, in 2011 or 2010, it came out in paperback in 2011, uh, which sort of sketches out the AFL operations, not only in, in Latin America, but also um, uh, Africa to a little, to a certain extent, and then also in the Philippines, where I've done a bunch of research as well. So we have seen this and they're continuing to work around the world. They have never given an honest report of what they've done. Uh, they keep lying. They're working with the NED. They're in 60 countries around the world, according to their own website. Now, we don't know what they're doing. We don't know why they're in these countries, but it's strange. A number of them are oil country, company, uh, countries, such as uh, Nigeria. They're in uh, Iraq. Uh, they have a nice little map on the Solidarity Center top page. If you scroll down, it shows all the countries they are in. Um, they're also, by the way, for those of you paying attention to this crisis in the Ukraine, they're also operating in the Ukraine. And so uh, that's going on today. I can't prove it, but I'm absolutely certain they played a role in the 2015 overthrow of the democratically elected government in Ukraine. So they're operating around the world. And I think I'll, I'll stop here. That gives you an overview. There's a lot of stuff there. Frank Hammer's written on this. He knows some stuff. Uh, we're getting more and more work about their, about their work, especially up to the 80s or up to the 90s with 
Uh, we don't have a whole lot since then, although there is a dissertation online for free by a man named G. Nelson Bass, B-A-S-S. You can, you can read it. It's, all, it's on the Solidarity Center itself. He's a political scientist. He was studying at the Florida International uh, University. And then we've also had uh, a number of articles published by a journal called Race, Class, and Corporate Power, which is an online journal from FIU and, and Bassett and, and a guy named Ron Cox are editors of that. So there's a growing amount of information that we know from around the world. We're not speculating. Uh, this can be backed up. And, um, you know, if, if, if this is something you want to take on, you need to, you need to recognize that it's got to be serious and it's got to be done. And I would encourage you very much uh, to uh, do whatever you can within your union and any affiliations and things like that. So I'm going to stop there. So thank you. Thanks very much. I understand. Thank, thank you very much, Ken. It's great to see you and hope you're well. Um, uh, let's hear from, uh, uh, I think Judy Ansel has a question for uh, Rob McKenzie. Thanks, Manny. And hi. Hi, Kim. Hi. Um, so uh, the way I come into this is I did a lot of work as a member of the Coalition for Justice in Michaela Doris in the um, in the 90s in early 2000s and uh, but I also first became aware of the uh, uh, the killings uh, the killing of um, uh, the worker at Quatitlan was when a member of um, actually our radio program um, who was a vice president at the fourth local in Kansas City local 249 went down with um, somebody from Rob's plant and a group of auto workers to protest. And I remember seeing photos of American auto workers in solidarity with the workers uh, in Kwatitlan uh, protesting the killing of Clito Nigmo. And so that I think that part of the story that's really important to understand is that at least in those days, the United Auto Workers was very firmly in. Um, support and solidarity with Ford workers. Our plant in Kansas City happened to be a sister plant to the Quatitlan plant. Uh, they both produced the Ford Tempo. And in fact, there was a lot of cross training. Uh, I met workers who came up from Mexico for training, although they were quite rigidly controlled. Also at the time NAFTA was passed, workers who were veterans of, of that struggle in Mexico City came up to Kansas City they also, I think, went to labor notes uh, to talk about what, how, why NAFTA was a really bad idea for Mexico. And, and so I just think it's important that, that there were people at the time who were very much aware of what was going on in, um, in Mexico. And I think it's also really important, and I hope this book, Rob, gets translated into Spanish, because yeah. I think it's really important for the Mexican labor movement to understand this history as well. Um, the, you know, the story with about the solidarity is, is a little interesting because, you know, the C, the Coalition for Justice and the Maquila Doris was formed as a, a partnership between a Benedictine nun and the AFL-CIO. And so, you know, you see the two faces here of the AFL-CIO. One, realizing NAFTA was coming. They were formed in 1989, about the same time as, as the, the um, strike at Quatitlan. And so it's, they saw NAFTA coming. They knew that instead of ignoring Mexican workers and ignoring Mexico and not caring at all about how US foreign policy was, you know, leaving our, our partner, our, our neighbor to the South completely behind and also uh, exploiting the hell out of it through the international financial institutions and the IMF and everything like that, they, uh, the AFL-CIO understood that we needed to start to develop international solidarity with Mexicans and Canadians because they all three uh, representatives of labor of all three countries were involved in CJM. And, um, but the other thing that I think is important and I haven't finished the book yet, so I can't say how much is covered is the effect the, of this failed struggle 
had on the Mexican labor movement and the development of independent unions in Mexico. Uh, it was mentioned that, you know, like GM Silao just kicked out the CTM. My God, it's been how many decades? If the Cuauhtitlan workers had succeeded in establishing an independent union, the whole labor history of, uh, of Mexico actually could have been quite different. So the role of the CIA and the AFL-CIO, uh, you know, a lot of people in Latin America call it the AFL-CIA, but anyway, um, the role that they played not only was deleterious to the workers of Mexico, but ultimately it was very deleterious to the interests of the workers of the United States as well. And we need to really understand how that all fits together. Thanks, Manny. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, Rob, would you uh, respond to uh, Judy's comments? Sure. I, you know, there's a lot of people on this Zoom who've given me a lot of help. So I could spend the rest of my time thanking all of them. Kim was one of them and Judy too. Judy put me in touch with the workers in Mexico that a graduate student at the University of Minnesota did interviews and made a huge difference. I, this probably wouldn't have happened without that. But I, I, think, I think what her comments, I, I agree with what she says, that there was always a very conservative element in labor and a very progressive. The workers I knew would never have supported what Afeld was doing down there. And I think that, you know, even on that flight document I showed, it was written by a guy who'd been a Afeld director in Mexico and then became assistant director of the International Affairs Department. There was a guy I'm sure was a CIA agent. There were two very progressive international staff guys who were trying to figure out how to do international solidarity. So there was always this conflict and tension and labor and it could have gone a lot better than it did. Um, and I mean, the whole issue of what role the CIA played, I started off with a blank slate. I had no previous, someone told me they thought the CIA was involved in US unions domestically. I scoffed at that. I thought that was ridiculous. I spent my whole career as a union officer and staff person. But when I started trying to figure out what was AFELD, who was running it? What was its relationship to the CIA? What was its relationship to labor? There is no question in my mind, it was a CIA run organization that the AFL-CIO provided cover for. What was the long-term effects of that? I think in the epilogue, I, I say, I don't really know what all this meant. I just know that it happened and that there was a lot better path for labor and you know what's left of it is probably on it now. It's, uh, people should uh, raise their hands if they've got questions. Uh, I, I see, uh, raise your, your um, Zoom hands, uh, but I, I see uh, Abby McKenzie and Rick McKenzie. No, I, I see uh, Richard. Richard uh, Melor had his hand up for a while. Go ahead. You got to unmute, Richard. Rob, are we muted? We're unmuted. Hi, Rob. Were, were, were you asking us to say something? I wasn't. No, this is my sister. So <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. And, and we have friends here uh, who are who are academics and, and my husband's here. So we're all enjoying a lot. And we do have a question. And it, this is we are probably the least knowledgeable person in your group. But we did not completely. We totally got that the CIA was the cover agent for these international groups and they are the ones who who uh, set the thugs to the plant. We didn't we don't totally understand the what this yeah what the CIA's motivation in that was. Why? Yeah, they, why, were, they, why? Were, they were fighting they the were, Cold War and one of the main fronts of the Cold War was labor. Uh, overseas. And I mean, at Quetitlan, I, I don't think they would have been there other than they were afraid these leftist socialists were going to take control of the Mexican labor movement or have a big influence okay. in it. So, it, so they it acted was, against yeah, okay. them. Yeah. yeah. So it was truly that they didn't want the, the, the union workforce to be controlled by a communist revolutionary type yep. people. And okay. That's, that's my view. Got it. Yeah. 
Before we go to the uh, yellow hands, uh, Richard Millor, did you want to speak? You're muted. If you do, you're muted. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yeah. You are. Okay. Firstly, I'd like to um, thank Rob personally just for the effort he's put into this. And uh, I, I'm part of a blog called Facts for Working People, and we've uh, got involved in a bit of a campaign around this. And um, it all started for me and really the campaign around it because Rob wrote, Bob wrote a very basic resolution that passed up there in the Duluth Labor body, uh, urging the AFL CIO to, and Trumpka to open the AFELD files. And um, through him and Frank Hammer, I found out about it and we got involved in it and we tried to, uh, we got resolutions, some resolutions. I'm a retired AFSME, I, I was in AFSME for 30 years and um, got resolutions uh, 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 supporting uh, uh, the, the resolution that Rob initially had gotten passed up there at Duluth. And I think um, the unfortunate thing about it is was that for me, a resolution like that and, the, and, and uh, what, when we're talking about international uh, solidarity and in international affairs is that that resolution I used it and a couple of others used it in order to um, in, uh, help rank and file members in my own union. I'm retired and got my own union to pass a resolution support in it. It's it's a vehicle for helping explain how uh, U.S. capitalism used the labor movement and and undermined international solidarity. That's what was important about getting that resolution passed in our locals. One downside for me is that with the thousands and thousands of lefties in my area, there were hardly any that would touch it with a barge pole because it would bring them into conflict with the labor officialdom, with the higher rank, higher uh, socialists and communists and members of all the various revolutionary groups would not never just never took it up and it's a great vehicle it was a great vehicle for explaining to the rank and file worker why we must support uh, uh um, um these things i haven't gotten the book yet i'm i'm gonna get it i might send it to rob to uh, sign it for me <laughs> you know love richard okay um but um anyway the last thing in in relation to um the, what what brother skypes was talking about international solidarity um i was read it was a uh, the Wall Street Journal had a piece about the what the what made the last century or the the events that shaped the century of the 20th century, and one of them was the decision of the AFL the AFL in the last century, the 19th century, to work with capitalism and not against it, and because that's what uh, uh, Brother Skype here was just talking about. Really, that that was in the late 90s, 1890s. And the Wall Street Journal, among other things, considered that one of the great events that shaped the, the, 20, the, the 20th century. So I think that's evidence of that. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm happy to be on here. And I, again, I want to thank Rob for all the work he's put into this. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, but since you mentioned uh, Frank Hammer, why don't we go to Frank uh, and then we'll start with the stack uh, with Steve. Go, go ahead, Frank. Uh, thank you very much, and I just uh, want to congratulate Rob. Um, I've sort of been at a distance overlooking his shoulder uh, and doing all the work that he's done to produce his book. And I think that dialogue and the conversation that he will initiate and his others uh, on this, uh, Jeff uh, Cherky, uh, Rob, he and I appeared on a panel uh, a couple of years ago at the labor uh, lodge in North Carolina and had a very important conversation. And one of the products is Rob coming out with his book. And I'm very happy. I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, I think that uh, in terms of the resolution that Rob initiated, which I think incredibly important, was the resolution saying that the AFL CIO should open its files, the AFL files. And I know that this was, has been the varying uh, steps. People have engaged with this. Uh, I, I was very happy that the Duluth Labor Council uh, even managed to pass it, uh, maybe uh, out in California as well. But as so long as this information is not disclosed, there's no way that people around the world and here in the US 
and have confidence that the Solidarity Center is anything but a completely instrument of the U.S. government. That's good. It's just, it's just, there's just no way around it. And I know that uh, in recent conversations about the uh, wonderful victory that was won by the GM Silao workers, who incidentally had expressed solidarity with GM workers while they were on strike here in the U.S. and lost their jobs over it. Uh, what a wonderful victory. And uh, we know that the Solidarity Center is involved with it. And so it raises the question, okay, how do we put this together? And I think that the, the, the demand for the uh, infield files to be finally exposed to the light would go a long way. And then the FCI would then have to uh, understand that it has to fundamentally change. That there's really truly going to be a global solidarity movement uh, with uh, US workers and workers abroad. Um, there's, um, I think the other thing, I mean, we always have to point out that APHIL's original board consisted in Latin America was certainly consisted of every major corporation that you could identify. And it was in the service of the corporate class, pure and simple. I think that that's the way I've always understood it. And uh, I think that the couching it as, uh, you know, we had to create three independent unions as opposed to the so-called communist ones it was just a ruse, and ultimately they were just helping the profits of the of the of the multinationals. And the bribe was that it would help some of the working class, the aristocracy of the working class here in the U.S. And I'll quit with that. Rob, thank you so very much for your book. Is that Rob, do you have a comment on that in terms of how you got access to uh, the files that you got? Yeah, um, that's part of the book. So I, I see there's a question asking about the resolution that's in the book too. But I do have to say yeah. Frank is in the book as his brother, who was an AFELD employee who was murdered in El Salvador in 1981. And so I spend a, quite a bit of time on the two of them on, on opposite sides of the political spectrum. Um, what was the question before I, did you have something you wanted me to address? Uh, no, I just was wondering how you got access. Oh, yeah. So that was when I started this in April of 2016. I thought maybe a four or five page paper about this, and I'd have to find an academic partner who knew how to write. And I thought I could get access to the AFEL files. So I started with some two friends in the national staff of the AFL CIO who started out helping me until the hammer came down. This is a taboo subject. I didn't know this in the AFL CIO. The files are all closed. Uh, they're at the George Meany Memorial Archive and the University of Maryland. So when I finally found out what was going on, it took me a year to find out that AFL-CIO wasn't allowing access to the files. I took a resolution to a couple of labor bodies in Minnesota. And there's some people on here who helped me with that. I saw Roy Magnuson here for a minute. Uh, and it, it passed at, at one of them, but the, they mobilized their staff and the officers they could and defeated the motion to open the AFL files. And they, they say there's a 50 year rule at the George Meany Memorial Archives. There's a 1966 AFL CIO executive board meeting where they denounced Victor Ruther for linking AFL and the CIA. That is still closed. They won't return my emails anymore. But I, what happened was I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the help of Senator Tammy Baldwin. I finally got 11 State Department cables, which broke the thing open. And I believe what happened was the AFL-CIO got wind of that, knew I had enough to publish, and then let me see 44 boxes of Mexico files. So I spent four days there in 2018. Now, they're not organized. They're they haven't done an session on them. They're not organized in folders or by topic. They're roughly piled in boxes, 4,400 boxes, vaguely associated with the subject. They won't, the AFL CIO won't give permission to the archives to do an accession on those files. So, what I was looking through was just piles of old papers that had been thrown out of file cabinets into boxes. But I found some important stuff. I mean, one thing Judy said about the locals were supporting the workers in Quetitlan. I found out that Owen Bieber, the president of the UAW, was on the board of trustees of AFEL. I have documents showing that. Yep. Um, 
Nobody knew it. I mean, he kept it a secret. What he was doing, I'm still not sure what he was doing there. But yeah, it was quite an ordeal getting into the archives, but very fruitful. And what really needs to happen to tell the story of what happened in the Cold War, the AFL-CIO has to open up those files. Even the International Affairs Department files are closed. So there's a lot there that they have not been willing to face yet, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and before we go to Steve Zeltzer, I just want to thank Judy Ansel for coming. She has a radio show out of Kansas City. Uh, she's a professor of labor studies uh, and uh, one of the leading activists in the country around labor and uh, internationalism. So thanks so much, Judy. Thanks, Manny. Uh, I'm, re I'm, I'm supposedly retired. <laughs> oh, it's great to see you, though, again. Hopefully he, he's again. been on the show. So thanks for the plug. Heartland Labor Forum. Thank you. So Steve Zeltzer, it's your turn. Uh, well, I, first I want to thank uh, the committee for having this because uh, there needs to be a big broader discussion in the labor movement about where labor is going and where it is. And it's interesting, the USMCA, which was a continuation NAFTA on steroids was supported by the AFL-CIO and uh, Obama. And that actually uh, supported privatization and uh, US capitalism taking over Mexico. And Mexico has basically become a colony of the United States, uh, not just by the corporations, but the AFL-CIO supporting the USMCA. Um, I think what we need to do though, is I, I think you know a fight, the AFL-CIO convention is gonna be in June in Philadelphia. And I do think there has to be a campaign to open the books uh, and for an apology to the Mexican working class and labor movement for these murders that took place. That's very critical. Uh, the other aspect is that, I mean, uh, the record of the AFL-CIO, the Ukraine, all over the world, it's extensive. And I'm working on a project with some other people to put together a website to have all the different countries in the world where the AFL-CIO is operated. They have the documents, pictures, testimony, including Franks uh, and a guy named David Hempson, who was in South Africa. Because we have to really document it and get it together. It's massive. And the other thing that is critical is that the AFL-CIO, they upped under um, Pelosi, the, the uh, continuation uh, budget resolution under Trump, they upped the budget of the uh, uh, National Endowment Democracy to $300 million a year. So now the AFL-CIO is getting $75 million for their international operations. So the idea that our unions are getting $75 million from the US government uh, for so-called solidarity raises a real question because, I mean, it makes uh, the AFL-CIO part of the apparatus of the U.S. government when you take that kind of money. So I think we have to take up the demand of political campaign, not a penny from the U.S. government. If we're going to have solidarity internationally, we do that with worker-to-worker -worker, uh, solidarity and joint action by unions fighting the same multinationals around the world. That's really the way to build internationalism and solidarity by workers in the United States linking up with workers around the world. So I think that there need to be some resolutions and education campaign uh, around this issue. And there's plans to have a press conference and rally at the AFL-CIO in April, uh, kind of a tribunal in front of the AFL-CIO, open up the books, no more $75 million, no more government funding of the AFL-CIO. And for resolutions of the AFL-CIO convention, for there to be a debate about these issues, because as we all know, most workers don't really know what's going on with the AFL-CIO and the Solidarity Center. They, they're not really even, most are not even aware of what's going on in their unions, much less the internationals. So I think this is a great opportunity with the book and with an education campaign to get this out and uh, to actually hear the voices of workers like in Brazil and Chile and El Salvador who've been affected by this. It's not just in Mexico. Uh, it's been a catastrophe and the AFL-CIO has worked with gangsters um, all over the world uh, to basically crush uh, independent trade union movement. And uh, the record is, is uh, means that they have blood on their hands and they have to be held accountable for that. Thank you, Rob. Do you have any uh, response to that or Kim? Uh... Uh, you know, actually, I, I'm, I think that the convention in June, if this gets enough attention around this issue, there is the possibility of change. I'm always an optimist about that, and they will have a convention in June. So let's hope can for you, the best. You can have a flyer for your book there, Rob. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, if they love me anywhere near the place. That's <laughs> and, and we'll have uh, Patrick back uh, to speak on Chile, if he's willing to. That'd be great. 
Um, uh, Manny, can you give the code for the book? Because the people I sent a notice out to, I didn't send them the code. Uh, yeah, I, I will. Um, they'll, uh, okay, I, I shall in a moment. Uh, so, uh, Howard, you're next. I'm going to look for the code. Go ahead, Howard. Howard, uh, you're next and you're muted. Yes, um, my, I have a, a question. With younger audit organizers coming up and the AFL-CIO stonewalling on, ever, on the archives and information and such, how can younger organizers challenge this and deal with this problem? The convention might be one way. Are there any ways within locals that younger people can challenge this based on this incredible history? And Rob, I want to thank you for writing this book, which I'd like to get. Okay, that's it. Is that to me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, you know, anybody can pass a resolution in a local union. And I tell you, the, about opening the AFELD files. Uh, you know, it's a very simple, fair resolution. I, I got the copy of the resolution I um, proposed and that some people put in these labor bodies. That, that has a big impact. You'd be surprised how disturbing that issue is. Can you share, can you share this resolution maybe on our list or, or something so we, sure. can, we can see that and possibly share it with others? Absolutely, I can um, email Manny a, a copy of it. Thank you. There's Roy Magnuson who made the motion at the St. Paul Trades and Labor Assembly there. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Annie, you're muted. Uh, yeah, I, I, I muted. Um, I, uh, I'm still looking for the code. Uh, and I'll get it to you. Uh, I think Karina's next. So Stuart's turn. put it up already. It's on the chat. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm also really looking forward to reading this book. This was such an excellent discussion. And, um, and thank you for all the work uh, that you've done uh, in terms of research for this as well. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to ask a question about Firstly, the response of the Mexican workers um, to your findings, if you went back um, and met with the workers, surviving workers, obviously, um, to talk about these, uh, these findings and your revelations. And then also, do you know of any unions, Global South unions, that um, are organizing either to kick Solidarity Center out or you know, organizing from that, like what I'm thinking in addition to writing a resolution, um, what could we do to stand in solidarity with Global South workers who are resisting um, the, the AFL-CIA uh, involvement in their countries, um, you know, via Solidarity Center and these other organizations that you met with. So yeah, are there, what's being done already? Thanks. I, um... After I got in touch with the Mexican workers, a graduate student from the University of Minnesota went down and she was in Mexico City, did five hours of interviews in Spanish with them and helped, helped me translate those and helped me with those. I was able to get in touch with them via email and clear up a lot of things. And between my Spanish and their English, we were able to exchange a lot of emails. I, I think I had some insights into this, which they they didn't. And I think I, I made, made it clear to them some of the things that happened. They had never heard of the American Institute for Free Labor Development. They were surprised the CIA was watching their group, but I had two declassified documents that show they were watching this group. So th they were very interested. I, I do think they're a little concerned about their safety on this. Um, once it was, I'd signed a contract to publish. I have not gotten any emails back from them and I respect what that they're doing and have not continued. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy place Mexico can be. One of the uh, guys who helped 
do research at the beginning now is working with this independent auto workers union. So they're having great success in that. And as far as what I know they can do, the AFL CIO actually supported the independent union in this election. They came out and made a statement in support of the independent union. It just it could have done that same thing 30 years ago. So, you know, as far as Mexico, they need help with making sure they have free and fair elections in their unions. And America has an, um, an impact on that. Biden spoke out on it too. And actually, if I understand, Frank Hammer was on a call where Solidarity Center was looking for ways to support the independent union in Salau, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of, the tide is turning on a lot of these things. And um, we, just, we just can't, as far as organized labor, tie your boat to a government agency because it can change course in an election uh, at any time. That would be my thought on that. Manny, if I, if I can say something more in, in uh, connection with that last question, one of the things is that uh, the, the Asian version of AFIELD, which was called the Asian American Free Labor Institute, was working in the Philippines. And uh, in my book on the KMU Labor Center, which came out in 96, I, I exposed their work with the death squad uh, in the Philippines. And I don't know how much effect that had on it, but I did note last night that the Solidarity Center is not working in the Philippines. But also, there has, been a, there has been a considerable amount of work over the last 30 years among workers. And there's, a, in fact, an entire network called SIGTER, the Southern Initiative on Globalization and Trade Union Rights, that includes labor unions, ra radical labor unions from uh, South Africa, India, uh, the Philippines, uh, South Korea, Brazil, and Argentina come immediately to mind, where that they're trying to create a a progressive labor organization to you know to globalize support and build solidarity. So there's a lot of things going on that most Americans have no ideas, and I've written about some of them. In fact, there's a book by a man named Robert O'Brien, a Canadian, that came out in 2019 on SIGTUR. So it gives you at least an introduction uh, to some of these things going on. And also uh, I'll ask Manny to, to pass on uh, my email or my, the website where I list all my publications because I've been working in the area of, of internet building global labor solidarity since 1983. So I've got almost 40 years where I've been doing this work and a lot of stuff the people have no idea that's existed or things like that. So I'm glad to see the, 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 the rebuilding of this because we went through a real lull, but we, we really have a, a long history once you start looking for resources and things like that. Thank you very much uh, for that, Kim. Uh, Ganesh is next, Ganesh Trichter. Hi, um, so thank you so much for this uh, really, uh, exciting and uh, um, I'm not exciting, very engaging. I mean, a, a really engaging discussions on the uh, CIA involvement in the US labor movement. You know, I was thinking in terms of Fred Hirsch, the, the Fred Hirsch was mentioned um, in the discussions. Fred Hirsch also has a book uh, published in 1977 on, uh, um, I mean, I think it's called the CIA and the labor movement. Uh, in England, uh, in, in Britain. Uh, so I was just wondering if those, I mean, if the files on the CIA's involvement in the British labor movement are open, um, if they were open, would that uh, uh, offer, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what that means. I mean, uh, but, but if it were open, it would allow access to, uh, allow more access for people to um, getting more knowledge about the CIA's involvement in labor struggles elsewhere. Okay, uh, that, book, that book, you're right, came out in, I think, 77, uh, was a result of a, a talk <laughs> that Fred gave. Fred and I became very close personal friends, is how I know this. And uh, 
that came out at that time. Uh, however, there's a, a, I think a more important book on the British labor movement called Where Were You Brother? And it was written by Don Thompson and Rodney Larson. Thompson was a Brit, Larson was a, was a Yank. And that came out in 1978 and it was published by War on Want, which is a uh, po anti-poverty charity in, uh, in the UK. So that talks about a lot of the, of the uh, work of the British <laughs> Union Congress in the British Empire as well. Um, and in fact, uh, meeting the author, one of the authors, Don Thompson, is what got me started back in 83. So it's a quite, a, quite a excellent book, a good place to look at. Uh, there is a new book coming out, I think, either later this year or next year on the Canadian labor movement by a woman named Catherine Nostovsky, who's uh, looked at their work in, during the Cold War and how the Canadians did this stuff. So there's a growing amount of work. I saw Jeff Shirky, he's here. Jeff's, uh, I know, has got a, a book contract for a book on the AFL-CIO's uh, foreign policy. I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, there's, there's, like I say, there's a lot of, of work out there that, that uh, most people don't, don't know is out there, but there's actually quite a bit that we found out over, people have been writing on this stuff since the 60s. Uh, and so there's, there's much more than you might imagine, even though it's, it's one that the left in the labor movement has not picked up, uh, picked up on as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Carol Lang. Hi, I'm, this has just been such a wonderful discussion. I so appreciate, you know, this happening. Um, so I have a, a number of uh, questions and, um, also, I wanted uh, to say that I think that um, Kim's analysis of the AFL from the very beginning, from its very inception, has been one that's been clearly very pro-America and has been very racist, very sexist, anti-immigrant, and, you know, has been initially when it first you know, got off the ground, it didn't want to support any politics whatsoever. But essentially, Gompers came around to understanding that he had to support the idea of supporting political candidates. And so to just reform um, the AFL and the unions and think that you can get some better candidate in, in order to promote the the you know uh, it, it's the ideas of labor i think is really you know barking up the wrong tree it's clearly has been from its very inception one that's been chauvinistic one that's been jingoistic and racist and all of that and you know we have to build within you know the labor movement something that's going to fight against the politics and the ideas and the philosophy of the AFL in, in the first place, as opposed to just sort of saying, well, what we need is another, you know, a better Democrat or something like that. Let's give some more money to the Democrats, this person, or, because it's the very nature of the AFL to be what it is. And I think that as long as the AFL sees itself as something that's channeling workers as opposed to supporting workers' struggles, then we're always going to be barking up, you know, the wrong tree. And so, you know, I, I want to thank Kim for talking about its inceptions as opposed to it turning into something later on. Um, I have a couple of questions. There's a, there's a struggle going on in South Africa now among workers who are fighting against their bosses who own the clover factories that, that's owned by the Zionists. And I'm just wondering if there's any way to find out. I, I had organized a demonstration actually that, that um, Karina came to in support in, in front of the Israeli embassy, um, the consulate in opposition to the Israeli owners. And I'm just wondering if there's any way to find out if the CIA is, you know, or the AFL is doing anything to undermine the struggle in any way. I, I mean, I don't know. And I'm just wondering if anybody would know that. Um, 
And, you know, the, the other thing is, is that people like Randy Weingarten in our, who's the president of our union, is a supporter of the history judge. And the history jut is has historically been something that has supported Zionism. And so I, I think it's time to start to build a different type of labor movement and maybe going organizing and going down to the convention and bringing resolutions and voices of people internationally and flyers and, you know, to, to start to expose the AFL so that so that the workers in the unions know exactly why they're not only has they've been historically sold out, but what they've done historically to workers around the world. And it's time to build that kind of solidarity for, you know, between workers all over the world. Okay, so that's Thanks it. To those comments, uh, uh, did, does anyone have any answer to those questions? Judy's got her hand up. Judy, Judy go, go ahead. Yeah, well, I don't think I have a complete answer. But I just wanted to make a comment. I, I, mean, I, I agree a lot with what you said, Carol. Um, the, you know, the problem with the American labor movement is that, um, you know, for years and years and years, of course, it was anti-communist and supported U.S. Cold War policy all over the world and in the United States. You know, and we can go back to the McCarthy era to, to look at how, you know, so many leftists in the labor movement themselves were, you know, like rooted out and um, unions were purged uh, from the from the AF, from the CIO actually. Yeah. But um, not, on, not only did the, the, those policies help make the world safe for multinational corporations to exploit and move our jobs to, but the economic nationalism of the AFL policy persists to today. And, and so there, there's no real clear analysis or understanding of why global solidarity will make a difference for American workers. In fact, you know, if you look at the policies of a number of unions who have otherwise good militant leadership, they're very much economic nationalists. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly of industrial unions policies towards China. And um, the, the whole protectionism of American jobs is antithetical to the concept of international solidarity. And as soon as you know, like we, we started bleeding jobs to Mexico and Asia, the reaction of the American labor movement was a reaction of protectionism and a reaction of economic nationalism rather than having an international analysis of what was going on and an international analysis of capital. And, and so, you know, like it, it's a real problem because I think the, the whole culture of American labor has been organized around that. I mean, you know, unions today are still putting up Buy America uh, slogans and their banners and everything. And the UAW is one of the worst offenders of that. And, and so, you know, I think that culture and that analysis of, of you know, like what's good for American workers um, and, you know, unions are good for American workers, but a certain, but the kind of unions we need really do need to change. But, you know, I hate, I hate to be a bummer, but, you know, like it, that's a huge, that's a huge undertaking. <laughs> One that a lot of us have been trying our whole lives, but we're still not there. Thank Thanks you. for your answer to uh, Carol's question, Judy. Uh, uh, Tony Grinovich. Yeah, I, want, I want to go back to um, Walter Ruther. The issue of war. It's very was a very important issue in the 60s, as you know, with Vietnam, and also working with black workers, which Ruther pioneered. He was one of uh, he was at the March on Washington in 63. He was a big supporter of Martin Luther King. He was also at that time a supporter of the war. But when he shifted and left the AFL CIO. Um, and split from them and presented himself as the leader of the labor movement against the war. 
Oh, I'm gonna, turn, gonna turn this off. Anyway, I'll, I'll wireless color. I'm taking the wire. You got it, Tony. Oh, it's my daughter. <laughs> I should have told her. That's my third uh, Zoom call today. When he shifted <clears throat> and set up his own labor organization, <clears throat> Um, and of course, Meany was, if anybody was in the CIA, it was Meany. Uh, the day after, um, in, in, in 1970, there, um, you mentioned Ruther's assassination. His assassination occurred on May 8th, 1970. And on the next day was this huge hard hat demonstration, which you had a coalition of the New York City Police Department directing World Trade Center workers to this beating up of student protesters at Federal Hall. You had the mafia, because later that month, Nixon brings in all these mafia leaders of New York labor movement. So there was the mafia, the NYPD, obviously the CIA was involved. There was a New York graphic. And there was a, the coalition was together at that, at that point in time, I would say that Luther was the most prominent anti-Vietnam War guy. And the next day he's going to be killed. So it was perfect for Nixon after, you know, they killed Kennedy's, the Kennedys and King and so on. Uh, so the, you, you, you chopped off the only anti-war leader in the labor movement, the most prominent. And it was clear sailing because the issue of race and the issue of war go together. U.S. imperialism is directed against the world and most of the world is uh, not European, it's Asian, obviously. So getting rid of Ruther who prided himself on trying to integrate the UAW was a big coup. I think that, I mean, I'm trying to bring that out. I'm working on a domestic side of U.S. imperialism, uh, the history. And to me, Ruther shifted his shift. I mean, he basically didn't know what he was doing. He believed he was a social Democrat in the 40s. He was anti-communist. But after the assassinations, uh, he took his entire union out. And that was the end of it. So would you agree with that interpretation? Rob, it's, I think, directed to you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, Ruther is a complicated figure. I, you know, I, I don't know if I got time to present all my views, but I, I really think no, that okay. he challenged the AFL CIO and their relationship with the CIA, and th that cost him his life. And he was very determined to follow that through. And I do believe it, it was actually, I mean, there's so much in this that uh, in 1968, they were in a plane crash, Walter and Victor in the private jet, same conditions as the one that killed him. A pilot too low, didn't know how low he was, probably an alt altimeter. And, you know, I, I honestly, I think, and I've been back and forth in Ruther. I've been on the end of getting beaten by the Ruther caucus for several decades. But I think he was as good as a, a national leader in American labor could be and was. And, you know, he did, he supported the war. Um, and then when Johnson was gone, he switched. When Johnson left, then he switched and became an anti-war candidate. And that, you know, some people suspect that as an issue for the assassination. I, I still think it was, he had, they, they had said that they were going to expose the CIA. Uh, Victor, I have a quote in his book. He, he said, uh, I did my best to raise a lid on this. Someday it will all come out. And um, there were 200 pages. Michael Parenti wrote a book and an article in 1995 said that he did a Freedom of Information Act request. There are 200 pages of documents the FBI had on the crash, which they would not release for national security reasons. So I filed a new FOIA on that, and they're saying they don't have those documents. So I, I've got that going to a non-binding arbitration, but uh, 
there's a lot there with Ruther. I, I, don't, I probably didn't answer your question and I hope, hope I tried. <laughs> Hey, Jackie, and I think there are some people in chat who uh, probably should speak, I think, including Tony O'Brien. Go, go, go ahead, Jackie. Uh, yeah, I want to raise an issue that could relate to what the practice of this committee might be in relationship to the activity of our union, the PSC, because we are a local of the American Federation of Teachers, which, you know, is it seems to me is very much linked to the CIA. Uh, Randy Weingarten, the head of the AFT, was a member of the first delegation to go to the Ukraine after the coup and to yeah. welcome the Nazis who had been put into uh, that uh, leadership of that new leadership of the uh, of the Ukraine. And in the past, we had created an anti-imperialist peace and justice caucus in the AFT. And through that, we had brought resolutions challenging Randy Weingarten uh, and eventually getting past uh, anti-war resolutions in the uh, national AFT. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about what a group like ours could do in relationship to a pro-imperialist uh, leadership of the AFT. Is that for Rob me? and then Kim, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of Maybe Kim's alley, but what I, what, I am what I think needs to be focused on is again, the convention which who knows what's gonna happen in that convention. There's a lot of speculation that Sarah Nelson's gonna run. And she is a militant unionist and a Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, so it really may be a chaotic situation. I think we should ask for that all the AFL, all the international affairs the archives be opened, that the, there's a um, Meany Kirkland Human Rights Award. <laughs> I, I'm, got a blog coming out saying we need to get rid of that. Even with what we know now, that is a mockery of history. Uh, and they know it is too. <laughs> and um, the other thing is, I think they should establish something like a Truth and Reco Reconciliation Commission, where AFL-CIO picks people to go back through the archives and give a report about what happened in the Cold War. What was the relationship with the CIA? What was the effect of this? Again, I think those are very fair, calm, reasonable proposals. And that's what I'm gonna be advocating in, in the next few months. If I, if I can add to that, I think you know, one of the things is, is that you know, for, for you all to pass something through the PSC, will set an example that could be spread around the, around the country. But I think a lot of the folks that are uh, identified as activists or leftists or something in the labor movement need to be pressured to get on this. There are a lot of people that have long histories, that's good histories, who've never done anything on this and they need to come on, a, on board. But I think, that's, I think that's an important part. Uh, those are three resolutions right there uh, that Rob gave us. Uh, Patrick, do you want to comment on this? We haven't heard too much from you. No, I know. I, I mean, being based in Britain, I think Rob's best place to comment on this. And he's obviously got this strategy worked out for June that I, I hope to be able to support uh, when the time comes. Um, I think it, it makes total sense as well. Um, it's time that the current leaders fronted up to this. There's maybe, I know Kim's spoken very well today, and I thank him for that on the current situation and what's going on with the Solidarity Center. With what we've talked about in the book, there is that kind of historical distance that maybe could be used as, you know, there's, there's really no excuse why your contemporary union leaders shouldn't come out opposing this. Um, just picking up on some of the points that have been made earlier, which have been really good and uh, very informative. Um, the key point to emphasize is that not only obviously were atrocities committed in the name of 
advancing free trade unionism, but also that this has backfired spectacularly on the American working class, obviously the European working class as well, but the movement of jobs overseas, the uh, degradation of workers' rights, that is a product of these activities. So, you know, make the case in June and hopefully we can get something won from it. Thanks, Ben Patrick. Okay, I just got a message, so I'm responding. Uh, Tony O'Brien, uh, and then we're going to have to, you know, whoever is on this. Didn't, miss, didn't somebody by the name of Magnuson have their hands up before? Sorry. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, yes, uh, it's exciting to have all these distinguished labor historians and uh, labor detectives and imperialism detectives on uh, on the call, and we have I think uh, almost double our usual attendance. So I'm really excited uh, to have this discussion. Uh, I think uh, Jackie DeSalvo went where I was going to go. Uh, what is the implication for us in the PSC? And uh, the two things that strike me as questions that I would like uh, to, uh, to hear your thoughts on. Uh, one is, um, this all this research should be the subject of a forum that we do within our own union. We have thirty thousand members. Uh, a forum within our own union called something like "Why Labor Internationalism Follow the Money," something like that. In other words, the the fact that our own dues are being used. We we send an incredible amount of dues to the AFT. Our own dues are being used directly for out and out imperialist activity by the US, US government. So that, um, I think that's one point. Uh, what do you think of that? Have you done that in your own uh, unions, uh, that kind of political education internally? And this means meeting people where they are. You know, There's no implication that because the CIA did bad things in most people's minds, therefore the PSC should be internationalist. I mean, we have to make that, make that argument. I think there may be a bit too much of the kind of gotcha, uh, you know, detective work uh, without a, going to what Judy Ansell was talking about, a fundamental reason why uh, workers in the global north should oppose their own imperialisms, including the British and the French and so forth. Um, the, 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 the second point is really, um, how do we overcome this idea of a global labor aristocracy? I mean, you know, Marx and Engels writing about the unions had a lot to say about the reactionary effect of trade unions, especially the British ones. And as the British were trade unionists and the French were revolutionaries. And obviously Marx and Engels were with the French rather than the British traditions there. So I think that opens up a question I'd like to hear uh, our speakers respond to. Uh, can you really d combat imperialism uh, through the unions? Don't you need a revolutionary? All right, a communist, a revolutionary, uh, you know, element here. Um, don't you need the French tradition, you know, as well as the British? Certainly agree. Um, uh, Rob, do uh, you want to comment on that? <laughs> uh, you're on mute. Sorry about that, Rob. Rob, you're on mute. Yeah, looking at what a complicated question, very complicated. What looking at what happened Quetitlan, I could see the level of organizing and activity, and the things they were doing there. There is no way that came out of a trade union. And I told this graduate student, now "Listen, this had to be a political a leftist political group doing this." And we stayed on it until we found it, and they were willing to talk about it. So, you know, of course, labor needs committed political people with vision to make changes. It just doesn't happen out of regular trade union meetings if people even show up at those. But exactly what that political program is and what that vision is, I am not sure. I could not give you a, a simple answer about what I think that is at this point in my life. There are many times in my life I thought I knew, I'm not sure I know anymore. Okay, uh, last question, Steve Zeltzer, and then we've got to go on to other business. And uh, I yeah, see Frank, I, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, Frank Goldsmith also has comments. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, first thing is education. As I said earlier, most workers are unaware 
of the role of the AFL-CIO, the Solidarity Center. Who is the Solidarity Center? Most people don't even know what it is. So we have some education to do. And I, I think that uh, that is, uh, you know, there has to be a debate and discussion in the labor movement. And that can lead to resolutions or support resolutions uh, around what happened in Mexico, an apology, opening the books. And the other thing is $75 million. Uh, that's a large part of the budget of the AFL-CIO that comes from the US government. Is it principled for a labor movement? They talk about government unions in other countries. I'm not in favor of government unions, but doesn't that make the AFL-CIO a government union when $75 million of its budget is coming from the US government? And I, I, Frank didn't mention it, but you know they have a Columbia operation, a National Endowment for Democracy, uh, that supposedly is helping out the Colombian workers. They never uh, report on the fact that there's an encampment of uh, injured GM workers in Colombia, at Bogota, who are demanding justice uh, from GM. Well, that's something that they're not reporting on. So uh, they don't want to report on that because that would conflict with General Motors, a uh, US multinational that's in Colombia. So I think that we can uh, organize education and, and demand that the, U the, the unions don't take money from the US government. I mean, the funding of these operations like going to Ukraine by Randy Weingarten, who paid for that? Was that AFT members or was it the US government? The US government is funding these centers around the world. And if you look at the uh, Solidarity Center website, it's run like a US government website, uh, getting jobs and that kind of thing. So we, we've got a, a US appendage, US government appendage in the AFL-CIO. That has to be part of the debate. And also Sarah Nelson, well, where does Sarah Nelson stand on this? Because Sarah Nelson is part of the AFL-CIO. She's vice president of my union, the CWA. There was a debate around Palestine at the CWA convention. Sarah Nelson didn't speak up around that. So if there's gonna be somebody who challenges uh, Schiller, uh, Schuller rather, uh, where do they stand on these important issues? You know, So that's, those are things that have to be addressed. But I think there will be debates. The other last point is fascism because it's not just fascism in, in Ukraine. We've got support of fascist movements in the United States and the silence of the AFL-CIO is uh, very significant because we're not gonna stop fascism with Biden and the Democrats. And we have to organize and educate people about the rise of fascism. And that's not happening within the labor movement. There has to be a debate and discussion. And uh, the rise of fascism internationally is something that we have to be very concerned about. That has to be an issue also as well for the working class in the AFL-CIO. Okay, Frank, you got the last word before we uh, close this section and uh, plug the book once more. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I would, uh, every, the research on the, uh, on the hypocrisy and duplicity of the AFL-CIO uh, since 1946, when it left the World Federation of Trade Unions, that's what we're living with today. When Walter Ruther, as everybody loves him, he was the worst, the worst one in UAW. He took a union that was a class-oriented, left-wing union and cooperated with the, the Ford Motor Company and General Motors to kill the Communist Party in the UAW. Roger Kieran's book on that documents the whole thing. <clears throat> Cleary in uh, the IUE worked work with General Electric to get rid of the UE and the left wing in the General Electric system. Both of those companies were fascist supporting companies during World War II. That's what we're dealing with. Now, everything since then, you know, I happened to have met Carl Gershman in Pitt, Pittsburgh, when he was with the Students for Peace, arguing in favor of the war in Vietnam. Patrick J. O'Farrell, who worked in the research department of the Steelworkers Union, where I was working, left my union and went to work in Africa. White. Irish guy from Ohio, a tennis player, who knew nothing about anything, but he was very happy. And he's still there, by the way, Patrick J. O'Farrell. <clears throat> so getting back to what I think is a question we should raise later on, a different discussion, is what Judy raised. That is this fundamental difference in how a union should run. Is it a class-oriented union, which fights for the working class, or is it a union which fights for a better deal from a corporation? That's what we're up against. That's what we should be fighting for. In Britain, Britain was the first trade union, TUC, in 1946 to leave the World Federation of Trade Unions. They're the first ones to leave. 
and they're still rotten to their core. Uh, the leadership of the of the uh, TUC and most of the unions over there, except for the RMT under Bob Crow. So what I would suggest is that we have a discussion with Judy to talk about a fundamental realignment re of what a union is for. It's not to make a better deal, not to a better deal, although we want to do that. It's to, it's to work for our working class. We call it class-oriented trade unionism, not collaboration trade unionism. Uh, otherwise, we're just whistling in a wind with changing this leader or that leader. We like this, we like, we like Sarah Nelson, we like that. This one or that one. I mean, John Sweeney showed that in, in the struggle in Seattle. We shut down, the labor movement shut down the WTO in, in the year 2000. They had civil disobedience in front of that building. That was the first time there's ever been such a uh, confrontation of the AFL. And they killed it. They killed him too. They didn't kill him physically, but they just, that was the one hope. And it, they, uh, because it wasn't based in the working class, among the union, among the rank and file, it was able to be knocked off. So it's a whole different attitude. It's what we're trying to do here at PSC is to have trade union activity and resolutions which the rank and file agrees to. When we got a resolution on Palestine uh, put before the, the executive, whatever it's called, executive committee, whatever, and it passed almost two to one, that's amazing. Then we just got one on Cuba getting rid of the sanctions, and that was almost unanimous. That is groundbreaking stuff. That would not happen under, under Shanker, under Feldman, by the way. And, that, and the one thing we could do, and we've talked about this, and I'll quit, is to get rid of the NED out of the Shanker Institute, out of the AFT. <clears throat> a resolution, we had talked about doing that. That would be a one thing that, we, that would be educational to our, to our, uh, our membership. Thank you. But I thought it was a great discussion. Don't get me wrong. The research of uh, exposing the hypocrisy of the AFL-CIO, it's all extremely important, and we can't stop, stop from doing it. But it's not going to change the labor movement. What's going to change the labor movement from the bottom up is from a class-conscious trade unionism and not one just looking for a better deal, a better job, a, a better staff position to make your $80,000 a year with a pension. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Those are great closing words. Um, would like to uh, give a plug for the book again. Um, and therefore, Rob, uh, do you want to uh, talk about the book? Uh, it's IC40 is the discount code. That, that is it. That's just I wanted to make sure the people I invited had the code if they wanted it. IC40. You want to say the book again? It's called El Gope. U.S. Labor, the CIA, and the crew at Ford in Mexico. And it's available from Pluto Press, uh, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Uh, it seems to be in all the uh, book selling sites right now. Yeah, it's a great read. It'll be available I, I, on February 20th. So what's the code again? IC40 as an international committee 40. Thank you. Yeah. But it, yeah, it may take a while. Okay, thank you very much, folks. Uh, we have a little business to do. Uh, 